All right. Yeah, so hello, everybody. Um, I'd just like to, to start off by giving a, a big shout out to uh, Christina Jones. Um, she set up and organized uh, our GPS data logger workshop for basically every single uh, turtle meeting in 2020. And uh, I was so excited for that that I had actually forgotten that I submitted this abstract to TSA last year. Um, so if you're in Tucson, uh, stick around. Uh, there's some updates and uh, changes. Um, but if you haven't seen this or if you weren't in uh, Tucson last year, um, the thing I'd like people to take home from, from this talk is that uh, you don't always have to be limited uh, or your research questions don't always have to be limited to uh, what's commercially available. So, so commercially available. So any technology that already exists. Um, so for example, I uh, work with these guys. These are uh, scalopers lizards, fence lizards. Um, the males are highly territorial. And so if you have a, a, a resident male and an intruder male comes in, they'll do this stereotype behavior where uh, they'll square off with each other laterally and uh, do push-ups. And so they evaluate each other's fighting ability through these push-ups. And if they're evenly matched, then they might engage in physical combat, but usually disputes are settled uh, just by doing these push-ups. And it's a, a fascinating behavior and scalopers lizards do it and, and all kinds of other genera and lizards do it. Um, and so there's been a lot of focus on what information they're conveying to each other through this. And then one of the, the, the good ways to do that or, or study that is to build a robotic lizard that can mimic the push-ups and you can manipulate it and see what's going on. Um, now, I'm less interested in what the lizards are talking to or telling each other about their fighting abilities. I'm more interested in, in predation. Um, and so a lot of the robots that were built for the conspecific behavior, the lizards talking to each other, um, are super expensive. And uh, I need something much cheaper so that I can put lots of them out in the field and try to elicit a, a predation event. And so I just went ahead and built my own robotic lizard. Um, so you can see the, the inside of it or the outside of it, just a latex lizard. Uh, there's a servo motor up here in the, the red cup that pushes a paper clip uh, up and down. So it moves the latex lizard up and down. Um, and so it's also much, much cheaper than what was uh, available. So now I can make lots of these. Uh, you can see it in action here. Um, so this is up at the uh, Toledo Zoo. I know it's winter. Lizards aren't out at, in winter, but uh, this Australian magpie didn't seem to matter or didn't seem to mind. Um, and so, yeah, uh, now I have a, a robotic lizard that um, can elicit predation responses. And uh, one of the other cool things are that uh, I added an accelerometer to this robot. So an accelerometer is just a component that you can, s that are actually on all of your smartphones. So it detects the orientation of your phone so it can change the screen. But in this case, I utilized the accelerometer to detect uh, when, a, uh, a when the, the model gets jostled by a predator. So it'll detect that motion. Uh, it'll use the real-time clock to create a timestamp. And I know exactly how long that, that uh, model has been out in the field before it gets attacked. Um, now, I'm not an electrical engineer, I'm not a computer programmer, um, but I was able to utilize this, uh, this device called Arduino uh, to do that. So you can see the Arduino is this uh, blue chip in the middle, um, and uh, Arduino is meant to get non-electrical engineers, non-computer programmers into making stuff. Uh, so it really makes it easy uh, uh, for people to jump into it and create something without necessarily having to have you know, several degrees in, in uh, electrical engineering to, to do it. And so Arduino is uh, basically two parts. You have uh, a hardware part. So the Arduino is a, a microcontroller. Uh, you could think of microcontrollers as a, a computer, but it doesn't have anywhere near the processing power that a computer has. And uh, so it can do very basic instructions uh, very, very, very well. Um, and so there's, there's lots of different flavors of Arduino. So you have the, the flagship one is the Uno. Uh, if you want something smaller, you can use the Micro. Uh, I use something even smaller than that called the, the Pro Mini. Uh, if you need something that has lots of processing power or lots of uh, uh, power, you can go up to a, a Mega. Um, but all, all of these uh, devices, all of these things are based off of a, a microcontroller chip called an AT Mega. In the bottom right, you can see a, a pinout of that chip. And in the top right, you can see the chip in the bottom left on that. And so these boards are just breakout boards. It makes it easier to access all the pins on these microcontroller chips. Um, 
but so that's that's the hardware that's that's what you use and you program and, and connect all kinds of peripherals or devices or leds or whatever you want to uh the second part is the the software and so uh programming in machine language is incredibly complex and difficult and so the folks at arduino kind of take that c plus plus based machine language and uh put a user-friendly happier uh shell on it so it makes it they a lot of the functions are, are intuitive and, and easy to understand it makes programming a lot easier so um so yeah that's the the two components to it so if you have the hardware and the software you could do all sorts of stuff and all of this is in the uh open source uh community so when somebody uses this uh to make a project they put out the the, the schematics and the software so that anybody uh, can access it and, and either replicate it or uh, manipulate it to what they want. That's that's basically what I did with my robotic lizard is I found plans on the online and just changed it to to what worked for me. So there's all kinds of cool projects. Like one of my favorites is uh, somebody made a, a Twitter account for their plant and put a, a hygrometer into the plant. So when the plant starts to get dry, it'll tweet, hey, I'm, I'm thirsty, you know, give me uh, some more water. Or uh, on the bottom right over here is somebody who sewed a bunch of LEDs uh, into their jacket so that they could have a turn signal for when they're riding their bike in, in New York City and uh, probably be more obvious to uh, motorists. All right, so while I was working on my robotic lizard, um, my colleague who's working on box turtles complained incessantly about how he would love to get a GPS data logger on his turtles, but on a, a shoestring graduate sc student budget, um, he couldn't afford them because uh, a lot of these are uh, pretty expensive, um, this was a couple of years ago, even, and they're still pretty expensive, several hundred dollars to into the thousands of dollars. Um, and so if you want one of these, you're usually, you can only afford a couple of them. And if you lose them, that's, that's a really big deal, which they tend to disappear in the field. So just working with what I knew about Arduino on the robotic lizard, I did a, a cursory uh, Google search on uh, GPS data loggers and found all sorts of stuff. So lots of people have built these uh, data loggers. And so all I needed to do was just figure out uh, the right components. So I found a bunch of uh, uh, GPS receivers that I could possibly use um, and use some of the code and, and change things to where I actually built a, a working prototype. Um, I, and this looks hideous, it's ugly, but it was a proof of concept um, and it worked. I even got into animal testing fairly quickly. And uh, yeah, so over the years, we've kind of refined the design. Uh, we put out a paper uh, a while ago that uh, introduces a lot of these things. It gives you schematics and a walkthrough. There's a video to show you how to build these. Uh, with our data logger workshop, our GPS work workshops, uh, we teach people how to build uh, one version. That's, uh, this is A in the bottom right figure. Uh, that's a lot easier, bigger components. It's easier to build. Uh, but the more kind of sophisticated, more data points uh, available and that sort of thing is in the bottom right. It's a little more difficult to put together, but, uh, but, but yeah, so we, we've refined it and uh, put that out there. So uh, the code is out there, the, the design is out there. And yeah, if you wanna put GPS loggers on turtles, then uh, this would be a good starting point. Um, people have uh, picked up on this. So there's a paper that came out a couple of months ago uh, where they started using these on rig neck pheasants in South Dakota. Um, so they modified it a little bit and uh, yeah, and they, they found uh, some success with, with these. Uh, this would be a good paper to go look for too if you want to look at uh, all the other stuff that you would need. So uh, soldering iron, solder, you know, things like that. Uh, we don't talk about that in our paper, but this one does a, a, an exhaustive uh, uh, equipment uh, list in that paper. Um, I've also started working with uh, uh, someone at the University of Georgia, which is right down the street. Uh, he does this sort of thing with pigeons. Uh, so he makes a hat for pigeons. Um, but the paper that they put out uh, two years ago um, had very large components and they were worried that the 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 package was weighing down and, and inhibiting uh, pigeon uh, flight because they want to look at uh, just uh, basically where pigeons go, how they choose different destinations and how to get to those destinations. And so with the accelerometer I use in, in my robotic lizard, I can then put that into the GPS logger. It's, it's much less of a, a hindrance to the pigeons. And with the accelerometer, you can actually get a wing beat pattern. So you can look at uh, every time uh, uh, the pigeon flaps its wings and, and how frequently and, and you could do stress and, and energy usage and all sorts of cool questions uh, can be answered with with those data. Now with our GPS loggers, um, uh, 
you still need to collect the data. So you need to find the animal again so that you can download the data. Uh, and the classic way to do that is with VHF transmitters. And the DIY world uh, is definitely uh, into that. So uh, folks who build model rockets uh, build their own VHF transmitters. So they have a lot of articles on how to build them uh, so that when you shoot the rocket off, uh, you can use uh, radio telemetry to go and uh, uh, collect your rocket. Um, there have been a couple of uh, engineering type folks who try to make uh, the smallest package of, of VHF transmitters, but, but they do uh, publish their schematics and schematics are a whole different ball of wax when it comes to learning and understanding how those things are. But it is very approachable. It just takes some time and look at a lot of schematics and, and uh, you can then take that schematic and then put parts together. Um, so uh, I've been talking to somebody in Virginia who builds their own VHF transmitters for box turtles specifically. Um, and so he's not an electrical engineer. I think he's a, a retired uh, 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 resource uh, manager, park service guy. Um, so just in his retirement, he likes to track, track bottle, box turtles. So he, he used these designs and built a, a fairly large VHF transmitter. But with I know about uh, the GPS logger and the smaller surface mount components, I'm going to take his design and try to, to make that uh, a much, much smaller, more efficient uh, VHF transmitter. So um, these ones, uh, at least with the components he uses, are actually just a couple of dollars worth of components. So uh, if you compare that to some commercial ones, they're 80, 90, over $100. Uh, this could be a cost-effective way uh, to, to introduce VHF to, to a project. Um, but with VHF transmitters, you also need uh, an antenna. And Yagi antennas are probably the most popular antennas out there. And they could be a little costly, 80, 90, over $100, or, or they're like 200 I don't really know that, but, but they can be costly, or at least more costly than uh, these VHF antennas. And the, um, the uh, ham radio world uh, is a huge DIY community, and they build their own Yagi antennas out of tape measure, so metal tape measure and PVC pipe. And uh, so this is one that I, I put together. There's actually an equation you can use to figure out the element lengths based on what frequency you're going to uh, uh, track to, to make it more uh, efficient. And this is just uh, a couple of bucks. If that, if you don't already have PVC pipe and a metal uh, measuring tape there. So uh, yeah, if you back over one of these with your truck or your field uh, tech leaves it out in the field, it's not that big of a deal. Um, okay, so uh, VHF transmitter, antenna, the last big costly thing of, of uh, radio telemetry is the receiver. And for the receiver, uh, I would focus on something called uh, software-defined radio. So where um, typical radio receivers use a crystal to interpret radio signals, this uses software. And so you get uh, two things from this. Uh, one, you get the audio that you normally get from a, a VHF uh, receiver, uh, the beeps. But it can also translate that into uh, a spectrum, so a visual component to it. And uh, this software-defined radio is literally just a $20 USB dongle that you could plug into a computer. Or uh, there's a, another thing you could use if you want to make this more portable. It's something called a Raspberry Pi, which, like the, unlike the Arduino, it is actually a computer. So it has lots of processing power. So you could put a little LCD screen on this and plug in a USB dongle, attach your measuring tape Yagi, and you've got a full system that's, that's super cheap compared to what's commercially available. And because it has this visual spectrum component to it, um, you can actually find signals just by looking at the spectrum. So I literally took a bunch of uh, VHF transmitters, dumped them on my bench table, and I was able to figure out what all of the frequencies are just by looking at the blips on the, uh, the, the spectral output of this. And that does probably mean that I could go out to somebody's field and find all of their animals without knowing any of their um, uh, their frequencies. Um, so that is something to keep in mind. This is kind of new, um, but this is, uh, uh, I guess, for conservation uh, purposes, uh, it's definitely something we need to, to start thinking about. Um, it's not, yeah, anyway, so we can talk about that later. Um, well, so just some other odds and ends type things. So uh, I've been working on uh, building environmental data loggers, which is a general purpose you know, temperature, moisture, humidity, all sorts of that sort of, uh, those kinds of things. Um, it's much, much cheaper than what you get out there uh, as a, uh, uh, what's commercially available. Um, another thing uh, that we're about to put 
uh, to the test is a, a nest activity logger. So this is a, um, I just combined uh, the real time clock from my robot, uh, the accelerometer and the same memory chip. And uh, you could put this into a turtle nest um, and then cover it back up. And uh, just whenever the turtles hatch, they'll start to move around and they'll jostle the, this logger. And so you can get uh, nest activity data. Um, so when, when they start to hatch and when they move around, how much they move around, and I guess if the movement stops, you can also figure out when they leave the nest as well without you ever having, uh, been, well, I guess only having been there the, the one time. Um, so this is just a prototype. I know it's really big and, and clunky, but we're just trying to get a, a proof of concept to uh, start putting in, well, I guess it's kind of late in the season, but uh, to start seeing if it, 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 it's feasible. And then one of my new favorite things is uh, photogrammetry. So I have, a, I have a student working with antlions and antlions in the larval stage build these pits that they sit at the bottom of and something will come along and fall in and they'll eat the, the prey. So they build these pit traps. And one of the classic things to do with antlion larvae is to look at the, the pit morphology. So you can look at pit size, pit depth, um, density of pits and try to figure out if those are correlated with or, or, or influenced by feeding, hunger, uh, whatever, species diversity. Um, but in a, uh, I found that it was very difficult to measure pit depth um, because you can't put a ruler in it because you'll mess up the, the pit. Uh, one of the papers I read, I contacted the author and he said he put string down in it until it touched the bottom. And then you pinch it off with your fingers and measure the distance of the, the string. And for the life of me, I could not figure out how it worked because my because you put the string in and then my fat fingers were not super accurate. And then uh, you can only measure one because you're lying on the ground trying to, to level off where it was. It just it, I could not figure it out uh, until I found photogrammetry. And photogrammetry is just where you take a whole bunch of images from different angles and the software will stitch those images together uh, and make a, a 3D object, a 3D digital object. And so this is uh, a bunch of antlion uh, pits. Uh, that's my business card that I use for scale. And uh, I created a 3D digital image of that. And so you can take that 3D image and actually just with some basic trigonometry, so you take the diameter of that. Uh, there was a paper published that showed that the angle of the pit is always 45 degrees. And so it's the, the depth is a right angle with the, uh, uh, the radius of the, the diameter of the pit and just do some trig and you can get the pit depth. Um, and so this, I use this for, for ant lines, but you could use this for uh, turtle nest morphology, uh, habitat uh, characteristics. Uh, you can take digital images of, of um, uh, the, the habitat around a nest and look how it changes over the years. Uh, a lot of people are putting these on drones so you can take uh, lots of very large aerial images of, of habitat and look at uh, habitat loss, or I think the most recent one, or one something I saw was just uh, the effect of a hurricane that came in and destroyed a whole bunch of stuff. So they had a before image of the habitat and an after, and you can go from tree to tree to, to leaf to leaf and, and uh, learn all kinds of things there. So uh, for any of the students out there, if you're going to grad school, uh, having just a, even a basic knowledge of this could make you more marketable. Um, uh, and uh, for those of you who are already out there doing research, I mean, uh, try not to be limited by uh, what's commercially available. So um, I guess in the comments, if you have, uh, if you are uh, familiar with Arduino and you've built something, go ahead, put some project you put in there that, that you think is your favorite. Or uh, if you've never seen this before, what's, what's something in your research that you could uh, uh, use that, could, that you can't seem to find that's uh, commercially available? Um, so yeah, uh, I guess with that, uh, yeah, that's all I have. Uh, thanks for, for watching. Um, and if you have any questions, uh, yeah, I think there are a few questions. All right, have we found out habits of tortoise? Oh wait, that's from the last. Oh no, that was it, okay. Uh, have we found out habits of tortoises and turtles with GPS that we never thought would happen? Or is this still ongoing? Um, Let's see, I don't know anything specific off the top of my head. Um, so one of the things I know, uh, my colleague Matt Cross, who I talked about earlier, and I are really interested in putting these log GPS loggers on turtles that, uh, or putting them on so that they're active at night, um, because we don't really know what turtles do at night. Um, 
maybe they move around if it's warm or not or, or whatever because it's hard to get out and do radio telemetry of turtles um, at night. So I think what turtles do at night is still fairly open. Um, and also with these loggers, uh, we're really interested in, in what turtles do during fire. So you can put these loggers on turtles and take a very frequent uh, location, uh, like say every minute, and do a prescribed burn and figure out uh, to whatever the accuracy is, to, you know, two meter accuracy, what the turtle is doing uh, for a fire. So does it try to run? Does it hunker down immediately or something like that? And because these are fairly cheap uh, GPS loggers, um, uh, the turtle will probably survive, but even if it gets hot enough to damage the components of the, the GPS logger, it's, um, yeah, you know, it's not going to break the bank. Uh, so no, there's, there's lots of questions uh, that could potentially be answered. Um, and you can also put all kinds of other components on these loggers. So if you want to put uh, a, a temperature sensor or, um, or uh, whatever else you want, they're, they're highly customizable, which makes them uh, very uh, mark more attractive than, than commercial units that are, that are less uh, customizable. All right, question two. What if you want to examine movements below GPS resolution? Is there a workaround you have found? Uh, so below GPS, so that would be uh, like microhabitat stuff. Um, the best you could get for GPS is about two, two and a half meters. Um, if you wanted to step up more accuracy there, uh, you're talking about much larger pieces of equipment, and that is definitely into the thousands. So if you want to get into like the centimeter accuracy, um, I don't think you could build something yet that you could attach to the turtle and leave. Um, so below GPS resolution, it, it would be, uh, or at least general GPS resolution, what might be difficult. Um, I hope I answered that. Uh, question three. Uh, what is the battery life like on the GPS units? Uh, would they have for would they work for semi-aquatic species? So the battery life depends highly on how frequently you uh, take a point, and also how long the receiver has to basically listen for satellites. Um, so if you're like in South Dakota uh, with the pheasants, they would put them out and they would get a a highly accurate fix. Um, in like 30 seconds because it's the plains, it's wide open, there's no obstruction of the signals. Uh, if you're in a dense forest, um, you might want to keep the, the, the receiver on for, for two minutes, which is going to drain battery power. Um, so it is a trade-off. Um, I have uh, an Excel uh, calculator that'll help you figure out if you do so many points per day and how long you, you open it, it'll tell you how long the, the, the unit should last. But uh, if you do some math, you should figure it out. Uh, if you take one point per day and you stay on for two minutes, I think it'll last like five or six months, if that gives you a ballpark. Um, and then the trick with aquatic species is that radio doesn't penetrate water very well. So if you have a turtle underwater, it's not going to get a, a GPS location. Um, so I actually have this GIF here of a, a, a water sensor that I threw together. Um, and so you could incorporate this into your GPS logger, and if it uh, detects water, just say don't even try to wake up because you're not going to get a signal. So you'll save lots of battery power that way. But if that turtle is basking and the GPS logger wakes up and it doesn't detect any water, then go ahead and, and take a, a, a GPS point. But uh, for most super aquatic turtles, you're probably not going to get many GPS points because it's um, uh, just the signal doesn't go into water. You might want to think about uh, uh, sonic type loggers. Uh, how effectively can we use these for undulating terrains of mountains? Um, I don't know that I understand what that means. Undulating terrains of mountains. Uh, so like if you're in a valley or something, um, do you get a good signal? I think that's what that question means. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the GPS loggers are, are just as limited as as any other commercially available one. They all have the same kind of limitations in that technology. Um, I, yeah, I don't know how to, to deal with that. That's a good question. Um, if you had the budget to buy these commercially, would you still go with these DIY component options? Um, oh yeah, if, if you can buy something and afford something from an actual licensed engineer, uh, that's probably the way to go. Plus they have customer support and they'll probably if there's a, a flaw or, or an, something wrong with your unit, they'll replace it for whatever. So, so yeah, if you can afford it, absolutely. Um, 
but uh, what makes these kind of uh, DIY things uh, attractive are that you know you can produce a whole bunch of these for very cheap. So you can ask uh, so many different types of questions uh, where costs would be uh, prohibitive. Uh, which of the items you described do you think is the most worth trying DIY? Uh, so if if you haven't been our, in Arduino or anything like that, I would have. There's lots of uh, starter kits. Um, uh, if you look at our our paper. Uh, there's a, a vendor called SparkFun. Uh, they have lots of guides and they explain lots of things. Um, so I'd get a, an Arduino uh, starter kit, uh, just get something together, blink an LED, and uh, you know, just start there, learn the code, find people's code, read it, try to understand what it means and that sort of thing. Uh, yeah, um, that's, that's probably the best way to go. And there's, yeah, there's lots of books and uh, so books that'll introduce Arduino. There's books that'll have just a whole bunch of projects that you can follow through uh, step by step. And uh, uh, yeah, just learn as you go. So I think uh, that's all the questions. All right, thank you very much.